would be opening your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 is where we will be this morning. And we're looking at the first 23 verses of Mark chapter 7 where we talk about uh, some subjects that are kind of uh, difficult for people, I think, and namely looking at the subject of tradition and the subject of defilement um, and what Jesus has to say about these things. In Mark chapter 7, and really kind of a pre- we've got to appreciate the setting of this before anything else, uh, at the end of chapter 6, the crowds were coming to Jesus intent on being healed. They had crossed over, they had come to land at Gennesaret, they were moored to the shore, they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized Him, and they ran about the whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place where they heard He was, and whenever He entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring Him that they might just touch the fringe of His cloak, and as many as touched it were being cured. Now that sounds like Jesus is pretty well liked amongst the the people that he interacts with here and there. But there is one group of people that continues to crop up again and again in the Gospels in a kind of, well, adversarial relationship to Jesus. That is the Pharisees and the scribes. And here in chapter 7, the enemies of Jesus re-enter the story. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when he had come from Jerusalem, and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unwa- eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corbin, that is to say given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down. You do many things such as that. Now here they go. Scribes, the Pharisees, They've come from Jerusalem, the text says, although the text does not say why they have come from Jerusalem. Maybe they want to see Jesus. And they notice something about Jesus' disciples, that they're not following the traditions of the elders. They didn't wash their hands before they eat. Eating with impure hands. Well, what's the big deal about that, guys? Is this a hygienic issue? Well, no, that's probably not what it is. The big deal is that this is, in fact, a violation of their ancestral traditions. Uh, The Pharisees, and really all the Jews, they had regulations about purity. Um, And it was somewhat based off of the laws. In the Law of Moses, like in Leviticus, for instance, whenever you you were unclean, one of the rituals that you had to engage in frequently was washing your body in water in order to be clean. And at some point along the line, this got extended into this ritual of making sure that you just wash your hands to cleanse them from whatever contact with the dead uh, or with defilement or whatever possible impurity they might have been connected with. You just wash your hands just to be on the safe side. And you got to, uh, and they have to carefully wash their hands. There was a whole ritual that went with this. Um, you know, they didn't have the the kinds of soaps that we have. Back then, there was this whole business of pouring the water over the one hand and then pouring the water over the other hand. Um, if they go to the marketplace, it says they can't eat unless they wash their hands in this way. Um, you know, you go to the market, you buy meat or something like that, and you've got to wash your hands after going to the market. And they also, Mark adds, they got all these other rules about washing too. Washing cups, pitchers, pots, things like that. And all this is done according to the traditions of the elders. 
And the Pharisees want to know, well, Jesus, how come your disciples don't follow the traditions? I mean, that's how we keep our balance, Jesus, tradition. And, you know, well, Jesus gives them two responses. First of all, he points to Isaiah. And he says, you're treating, God, you're treating your commandments like God's teachings. And secondly, he points to the practice of Corbin and says, you're using your traditions to get out of doing the commandments. And therein is lies the twofold problem of tradition. When you treat tradition like it's a commandment of God, or when you use tradition as an excuse for not doing what God has said. That's the problems. Are traditions bad in and of themselves? No. But can they be? Can they be perverted? Of course they can. And Jesus is going to point to examples here. But first he quotes from Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecy about vain worship, vain service to the Lord, treating men's commandments like God's teachings. He quotes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. And the verse is number 13. In Isaiah 29, verse 13 The Lord said, Because this people draw near to me with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Now the context of Isaiah 29 is actually dealing with this political situation that's going on in Israel. Uh, it's what we call the Assyrian crisis, took place uh, towards the end of the 8th century BC. The Assyrian Empire was taking over the world, and Israel was kind of worried, like, what are we going to do to stop them from invading our homeland? Judah was kind of worried, where Isaiah was prophesying, that the Assyrians would come and take everything over. And some of the people in Hezekiah's court, uh, maybe even Hezekiah himself at one point, I'm not sure, Isaiah's not clear on that point, Some of the people in Hezekiah's court were pushing for the idea of making an alliance with Egypt. Because the Egyptians were towards the south, towards the west. They were a strong enough superpower, maybe, they thought, to repel the Assyrians and kind of push them back. And the the Egyptians were kind of, you know, saying, hey, you know, you should join forces with us. After all, the Egyptians had a self-serving interest. If they had allies among the Israelites, then they had this convenient buffer zone between themselves and the Assyrians. And they could avoid uh, direct conflict, so to speak. And the prophet Isaiah you know, comes off, and you know, they, I mean, they may have argued, well, this alliance with Egypt is the smart thing to do. Except that the prophet Isaiah shows up and starts telling them off for it. And says that absolutely not, that is the wrong way to go. You trust in Egypt, it is to your own destruction. You try to solve your problems that way, that's tantamount to idolatry. Egypt is Rahab who rests. She is dragon do nothing. She is not going to save you. And you can just sort of picture the justifications that the people would use. You know, well, I mean, it's not like we've abandoned our faith in the Lord. We're just, you know, we've just got this little political solution here going on on the side. Well, we're still going to worship God. We're still going to honor Him as God. We're still going to go to the temple and offer the sacrifices and do all that, right? We just think that, you know, politically this is the best course of action. Let's, work, let's go, let's ally ourselves with the Egyptians, right? Isaiah says, that's a load of rubbish. You act that way, you know what your, you know what your devotion towards God is? He says, it's just tradition learned by rote is all it is. It's just a bunch of lip service. You don't really trust in the Lord, Isaiah says, because you're hedging your bets with the Egyptians, Yeah, you honor me with your lips, he says. But, verse 13 of Isaiah 29, they remove their hearts far from me. Their reference for me is just tradition, learned by rote. It's nothing. It's just a bunch of lip service. And worse still, your teaching is teachings, the commands of men. You're teaching man-made commandments as if they were actually teaching, as if they were actually some form of doctrine, as if they actually had any real substance to them. Folly, Isaiah says. And you know what Jesus says? He takes that passage from Isaiah 29 and he points at the Pharisees. He says, Isaiah was talking about you. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. I think this is a classic illustration of how prophecy and prediction work. Because Jesus is not saying, you know, well, 700 years ago Isaiah said, you know, that you Pharisees would show up and try to wreck everything for me. That's not what he said. He's saying when Isaiah spoke about the hypocrisy in his day, he was also talking about you. And if somebody were to commit such hypocrisy today, 
would be perfectly appropriate to cite Isaiah again. Say, well, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites. The people think that their tradition is important. So important that it allows the neglect of God's commandment. Just as in Isaiah's day, where they trusted in the false political solution and thus invalidated all of their their real faith towards God by making it into tradition learned by rote. And just like in Jesus' day, when the Pharisees acted, oh, well, you know, your disciples are you're not washing their hands. You can't possibly be real servants of God. When you judge someone on that basis, on whether or not they keep the traditions, now, what is your lip service to the Lord but mere lip service? Indeed. But Jesus goes further than that. He actually cites a specific example of the kind of thing that they're doing. He goes after something called Corbin. What is Corbin? Now, you do a... Uh, Verse 9, you do a good job setting aside the commandment. You are experts at setting aside the commandment. You know, when somebody calls you an expert, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things in life that are good to be experts at, right? This is not one of them. This is not, you know, well, you're, you're so good. You're so good at breaking God's commandments. You're so good at setting aside commandments for tradition. Oh, Jesus, now, that's unfair. Can you give us an example of what you're talking about? Okay, how about Corbin? What is Corbin? Well, the word Corbin was this Hebrew word for offering. In the Old Testament, it's used in Leviticus chapter 1, we're talking about the offering that's accepted. It's used a lot in Leviticus, you know, the Corbin. Uh, it's derived from the verb to draw near to somebody. Normally when you draw near to God, you're drawing near because you have a sacrifice to offer. And in this case, the Corbin is the thing that you're drawing near with, the offering of God. But here's the thing about Corbin. The law had specific instructions Honor your father and mother. It says that twice in Exodus 20, verse 12, and in Deuteronomy 5, and verse 16. It also says that he who speaks evil of father and mother must die. Exodus 21, and verse 17, Leviticus 20... Okay, well, there's no such thing as Leviticus 29, verse 9. So at some point I wrote the wrong verse down. But there's a passage in Leviticus... It's probably Leviticus 19, in verse 9, uh, if memory serves... He who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. That's pretty serious. You think God cares about the way you treat your parents? Yeah, He does, right? So what was the tradition of men? Well, the tradition of men, well, there were situations where people were saying, Mom, Dad, the money that I would give you, I gave it to God instead. Gave it to the Lord. Which when Jesus makes this comment, by the way, it implies that part of... Honoring father and mother involves caring for them in their old age. Um, you know, that's never explicitly stated in the law, but it seems to be implied by what Jesus says, and nobody disputes that interpretation. But that's not what was going on. The Pharisees were allowing people to kind of skip out on this. You know, I mean, you don't have to support them in their old age. You could give that money to something, you know, more spiritual, like the temple. You could give it to God instead. I mean... After all, mom, dad, you know, isn't the temple more important than you? Which is more which is more important? You know, you getting to eat this month or giving money to God? You, you see, I mean, when you phrase a question that right that way, you know, I mean, and you could phrase all I hear people all the time, there's sort of a running joke between my dad and myself every time we're proposing some activity, well, which is more important, us doing this or, you know, singing songs of worship to God? We could, you know, which is more important, getting to sleep at night or worshiping the Lord? And, you know, people have this notion that there's only a specific set of religious activities you can do and all the rest of it is just, you know, your waste of time. So you should give up sleeping and eating and all the other stuff that God created so that you can show your devotion to the Lord. Well, that's absurd. God never expected people to behave that way. So considering He created you with the need to sleep and the need to eat and the need to do all these other things, you know, and saying that sleeping or eating is not a spiritual activity is frankly absurd as well. So when these people show up and say, well, Mom and Dad, you know, I mean, you're just going to have to eat you know, cat food this month or something like that because I gave all your money to the temple. Oh, but, but, but isn't that more important? Don't you think the temple's more important than you? It's an unfair question. But Jesus says, no, that's sin is what that is. That's setting aside the commandment of God for the sake of some tradition you guys made up. God never said, deprive your parents of support for the temple. He never said that was good. He said, honor your father and mother. That was the commandment. No getting around that. You know, here we, 
It's, it's this, what we call this institutional view of religion where it's almost like everything that God thought the people should do is bound up in the temple. And don't think that that kind of thinking doesn't exist today. I mean, when people think that the... You know, it's like you see this in the view the way people view the local church. You know, hmm, should I eat this month or should I give my money to you know, this, this institution here? Well... You know, what happens is people think that the local church is the locus for all spiritual activity to the point they neglect the things that God instructed them to care for. Their personal life, family, parents, children. Don't even get me started on the stories about preachers who go out and, you know, they preach 30, 40 weeks out of the year in other places and then, oh, well, what happened? Well, they didn't spend any time raising their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Well, I'm preaching the gospel. Isn't that more spiritual? Yeah, you know what? I'm doing the work of the Lord. You know what else is the work of the Lord? God said, raise your children. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he says that in several places. Can't neglect the commandment of God for the sake of tradition. It's not allowed. Can we forsake the right thing to do the religious thing? The answer is no. You can't, you can't not do the right thing to do the religious thing. And I'm putting religious in quotes because true religion involves a lot, what would involve doing the right thing. Jesus says in verse 13, that you're doing this kind of thing all over the place. You do many things such as this. This is just one example of the way in which you have set aside the command of God for the sake of your tradition. Now, I mean, I, I think it's instructive to stop here and ask the question how we should think about tradition. Tradition, the word tradition is just something that's handed down. Is tradition a positive thing? Well, sometimes. You know, you can point to various writings of Paul in the New Testament, like in 1 Corinthians 11 or in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, where Paul tells people, keep the traditions that you heard or read, which came from us. But in another place, in Colossians 2, verse 8, Paul says, make sure that nobody takes you captive through the tradition of men, through empty philosophy. So is tradition a good thing or a bad thing? And the answer to that is, well, it depends. It depends on where the tradition came from. Traditions that come from God, well, you have to keep those because they're not really they're not really traditions in the sense we would think about them. They're commands of God. They were handed down from above. But traditions that come from men, traditions that were handed down by your ancestors... Well, those are optional. They can be kept or discarded at will depending on whether or not they serve a useful function. But no one, no one is allowed to judge each other over the keeping of man-made traditions. This is the reason why Jesus comes down so harsh on them. And you think, you know, what he says here in Mark is harsh. Read Luke's version of this where he visits the home of a Pharisee, doesn't wash his hands. The Pharisee just happens to notice the fact that he didn't wash his hands. And Jesus spends the rest of the meal giving this huge diatribe of woes against the Pharisees and the lawyers. Jesus think it was a bad idea to judge someone over whether or not they keep traditions? Uh, yeah. How can you tell the difference between a man-made tradition and a God-handed down tradition? Well, that's easy. You read the scripture. You know, the phrase, that's the way we've always done it, that phrase doesn't actually mean anything. You know, that's the way we've always done it. So, it can change. It doesn't even really need a reason to change. It just can. If our traditions are not in harmony with God's word, obviously they must change. And if our traditions are merely traditions of men, well, then... You know, they're open to criticism, frankly. And it's wrong to condemn people just for not following them. And so I would, you know, so just a couple of important principles. Number one, everybody has traditions. Everybody. I've never met a single person on the face of the earth that, has, that doesn't have traditions. You know why? Because in order to become a tradition, you have to do it twice. That's it. You know, that's, it. that's how you make traditions. You do something twice, now it's a tradition. You might break that tradition the third time, but, you know, you have traditions. And so when people say, well, we're non-traditional, it's always a bit self-contradictory. No, you have traditions, you just don't think they're the same as everybody else's. That's what you mean when you say you're non-traditional. You just, you just have different traditions from other people that you've met. Not all tradition, number two, not all traditions work the same everywhere or for everyone. I mean, churches, you know, you go visit churches... You visit lots of different churches here, abroad, wherever. Where do they meet? They meet in a house? 
Do they meet in a building like this one? Do they meet in a storefront? Do they meet by a lakeside? Whatever it is, that's a tradition. When do these churches meet? How often? Is it once on Sunday? Is it twice? Is it three times? How long? Is there a midweek Bible study? What day is it? Is there just one? The answers to all those questions are traditions. You know, you see some people, they get all riled up because they hear some church somewhere that did away with their Sunday night service. and you know, That's a tradition, guys. It's a tradition. And it's their discretion. That's their right as a local congregation to do that. Are there pews? Chairs? They sit on the floor? They sit in a circle? No, that's, that's a tradition. What's, what about the order of worship? How many songs do they have? How many prayers do they have? How long is the sermon? How much time is spent on the Lord's Supper? It's a tradition. There's no specified sermon length in Scripture, unless you count you know, Paul preaching until midnight, but I know some folks are going to you know, shake in their heads at that, like, don't you dare. <sighs> All right. <sighs> How is collection taken? You know, are plates passed around? Do they set up a box in the back? I've seen both. It's a tradition. How rigid is the structure? Is it the same every time? Is it flexible? Do people say, well, we'll do different things on the different Sundays of the month? Is it, you know, at a guy's discretion? No, that's tradition too. You know, some people want to argue and say, well, Paul said, Paul said things have to be done decently and in order. But guess what? Even your very definition of decency and in order is itself defined by your culture and tradition to some extent. Is it not? I mean, obviously, there's a point where it becomes chaos. The, the assembly has to be intelligible. That's the main point that Paul's getting at in 1 Corinthians 14. But all those things I talked about are tradition. And where people get into trouble, where we will get into trouble, is if we start thinking that our traditions are the same thing as God's laws. Or we start using our traditions to think, oh, well, maybe this makes me better than other people. Or maybe this makes me more spiritual than other people. You know? I had the had this discussion with somebody recently. It was a, well, maybe you think maybe you think two services on Sunday is better than one. It's what we do here. Maybe maybe you think, well, I'm I'm, I'm more spiritual than congregations that do it differently. But that's based on tradition. You're not more spiritual, you know. Otherwise, why not have a two a.m. service? I mean, because oh, well, well, you know, that's just inconvenient. But you were arguing, you know, that people should be willing to inconvenience themselves for Jesus. And you're not spiritual enough to wake up at two in the morning and come to church then. Really, no. Oh. It's tradition is what it is. And traditions, number three, are subject to change. If they aren't working, you know, there's some folks that cling to tradition and it's like it's a death grip. they got to have it. That's a spiritual problem. You've got to learn to recognize the difference between a command of God and a tradition of men. And number four, traditions are not to be obsessed over. Some people... Obsess over traditions by clinging to the ones they have. Some people obsess over traditions differently. They obsess over it by wanting to change it every five seconds. That's a problem too. You know, because you, they, they think that they're going to find greater spirituality by changing everything constantly. It doesn't work like that. You're not more spiritual because you keep the same traditions for 50 years, and you're not more spiritual because you change them every week. Your spiritual deficiencies will not be fixed by altering a bunch of effectively window dressing. Your real defilement is coming from somewhere else. That's why Jesus is so insistent on not honoring God just with their lips, but with their hearts. Of Isaiah, Isaiah spoke of the hypocrites and said, their heart is far from me. And that is where the real problem is. The defilement's not in the traditions. The defilement is in the heart. Speaking of the heart, that brings us to the next section of Mark. Rather convenient segue. In verse 14, after he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it go, does not go into his heart but into his stomach and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, That which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles from the man, from, from within. Out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. 
all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Jesus makes this really weird. You look at verses 14 and 15. He makes this declaration of the crowd that would have sounded really weird to them. Nothing outside the man can defile him. It's the things that, are, that come out of the man from inside are what defile him. Here you are worrying about unwashed hands, worrying about the dirt outside of you that got on your hands. Jesus said you should be worrying about what's coming out of you. That's kind of a bizarre statement because it's at odds with Jewish definitions of defilement. I mean, don't unclean foods defile you? Doesn't leprosy defile you? Doesn't contact with a leprous guy defile you? Doesn't touching a corpse defile you? Those are all things outside the man that defile, right? And dare I say that Jesus' statement here is at odds with a lot of Christians' understanding of defilement as well. You think that, oh, nothing outside a man that can defile him. Really? You know... You hear sermon after sermon sometimes of people, all the stuff outside you that can defile you, ruin you, contaminate you. Jesus' disciples are puzzled. They question him about this parable. Jesus explains. He says the stuff that comes in from the outside doesn't defile him. Why? Because it goes into his stomach. Uh, The New American Standard kind of sanitized that a little bit and says it is eliminated. Literally, it says it goes into the latrine. Uh, It's talking about this. uh, No, it's talking about passing through the digestive system. And then there's a parenthetical comment at the end of verse 19, thus he declared all foods clean, which uh, I think the King James you know, has, because, you know, goeth into the drop, purging all meats, which implies that the act of passing food through your digestive system cleanses the meat, but that's not Jesus' point. The point is that when Jesus said this, he cleansed all foods. He declared all foods to be clean. This is the point at which Jesus declared all foods clean. Later on in Acts, You know, God makes that point to Peter in the vision, what God has cleansed, let no man call unclean. Romans 14, verse 14, Paul cites this when he says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. The main thing that God has always cared about is the heart. The stomach, the stomach just processes whatever it gets. It just ejects it. It doesn't know better. But the heart, well, the heart tends to hold on to stuff. Tends to keep stuff tends to become a source of a lot of actions in and of itself. Stuff that comes out of a man can defile him. No. Does that mean that sin just isn't physical? Oh, we can do anything we want. You know, the sins of the body don't affect the inside of the person. Is that what that means? Oh, no. I mean, you've got to explain the stuff in the list, uh, like fornications on this list, for instance, which it's... You know, kind of odd, because the Corinthians were probably making this argument in 1 Corinthians 6, you know, that, oh, well, food is for the stomach, the stomach is for food, they'll both be eliminated, and, you know, that's why we can go see prostitutes, or something like that. Paul makes the point that, no, you know, you're actually sinning, well, this is actually a sin, you should actually flee from this. There's some sins that are just so inextricably tied to evil motives that they automatically defile. And when you look at what's going on here, and the things that he says in this list, evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, these are things that inherently defile the person. Deeds of coveting. What is a deed of coveting? Wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, Foolishness. Oh boy. Is it a sin to be foolish? According to Jesus, it can defile you. Because it's a sin of the heart. This is similar to other sin lists that you can find in various New Testament epistles. But if you look closely at this, these are the evil things that defile the man. And you know, it raises questions. You know, like, like, I mean, I've seen some Christians, they get really obsessed over how people are dressed. Everybody's dressed immodestly. You know, and they complain about that. Who's more defiled? The person who doesn't understand, who doesn't know how to dress modestly, or the person who engages actively in deeds of coveting? Which one is more defiling to the heart? Now, well, one of them is outside the body, and they don't know better. And one of them is coming out of the heart. And brethren like to preach that all sins are equal, but, you know, well, but... There's this deep-seated belief that, you know, well, no, some sins are just inherently more disgraceful, more punishable. Let me ask another question. Can unclean food actually defile a person? Not by itself. Oh. But sometimes, if you think it's unclean and then you eat it anyway, well, I know this is going to defile... Well, I think this will defile me, but I'm going to eat it anyway. 
Paul said to him who thinks it to be a sin, to him it is sin. Why? It's not because of the food itself. It's because of the heart. It's because you engaged in something you believed to be wickedness and you did it anyway. And wickedness, well, that comes out of the heart. You know. And so, I mean, you know, you can apply this across the board to my other illustration. Immodest clothing. Can that defile? Sure. But not because of the clothing itself. It's because of the heart. If the heart is wrong... Can throwing away traditions defile us? Yes. Turns out throwing away traditions, just discarding all traditions, can defile us if the heart is wrong. That's the key to this whole thing. The traditions themselves, they're just outside the body. They don't matter. But what you think in your heart, and you know whether you choose to violate that conscience, or the reasons, the motives that you give for violating those traditions, that can defile you. What about keeping the traditions? Can that defile you? Well, yeah. It turns out that can defile you too for the same reasons. Because of the heart. Because it turns out, and this raises this interesting question, Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands, so they were eating with, quote, impure hands. But who's really impure in this story? The one who didn't clean their hands and purify their hands? Or the one whose heart is far from God and was defiled by it subsequently? The tradition is irrelevant to the supreme question. Does God possess our hearts? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves each and every day. And that's the question with which we will conclude this morning. Does God possess our hearts? Does He have your heart? Is your heart right with God? You take out your songbooks. The song selected. Is thy heart right with God? It's almost like the song leader read the passage in question before we started this morning. Because that's what it ultimately boils down to. From the beginning, the Lord has desired our hearts. Are we going to give them to Him? Or are we going to continue stubbornly persisting in our own path? Is your heart right with the Lord? Does He own your heart? Does He own your life? Your motives? Your thoughts. Or are you still saying, oh, no, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to keep persisting in my own path. Serving myself. Well, that is the thing that defiles us most of all. If you're here this morning, you have not had your heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. You have not been immersed for the forgiveness of sins. If you have not been joined to the Lord Jesus, or perhaps you have been walking in a way that defiles your heart, and you need to make that right. And the Lord calls on us to turn our hearts to Him and give our hearts to Him so that we might spend eternity with Him. Won't you do that? While together we stand and we sing the song selected. Mm-hmm.
I want to thank everybody for being here this morning to worship the Lord with us, to study the Scriptures together. I hope that we have been encouraged in our walk with Him to become a little bit more like Jesus. Um, If there are no other announcements that need to be made at this time, I've been asked to lead us in closing prayer.